Welcome back to Body Talk with Bex. This week, I get to interview one of my mom's friends from her childhood. Her name is Jill, and she actually was diagnosed with diabetes back in the 70s when it wasn't quite as common. And so today we get to discuss how the technology has advanced and just what that looks like. So let's just jump right on in because it's really interesting. I've known my mom since you guys were kids. <laughs> I think we were three when we met. Wow. Okay. I didn't realize you were that little. <laughs> it might have been, yeah, because I think we were in playgroup together. I'm pretty sure she was in my playgroup. Wow. So a long time. Wow. Yeah. And yeah. so diabetes was less commonplace back then as well. Mm-hmm. So being diagnosed with it was a lot harder. It was a very jarring diagnosis at that time. I was diagnosed in 1977. I was 11 years old. I was the only diabetic I knew. Wow. Um, Certainly among my peers, I didn't know any adult onset diabetics even at that point. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. And there was no family history of it for me. Right. So it was out of left field. Yeah. Yeah. Well, can you just take us through like the symptoms that you were experiencing leading up to it and then how you were diagnosed? Yeah. So I was the typical 11 year old kid, right? Doing a lot of sleepovers and going out playing with friends. And, um, you know, back then we would go out biking until it got dark. And then as soon as the street lights came on, you biked home and having a lot of sleepovers with friends and things like that. And I noticed that I was sick a lot. I got strep throat a couple of times during the fall of, I guess this would have been fall of 1976. And my mom noticed that I was drinking a lot of milk and juice and water. And she took me to the doctor like twice and said, you know, I think she might be diabetic. Could you please run the test for her? And the doctor, who was not the best pediatrician, said, oh, no, it's not that. Don't worry about it. And time kept going on. And I remember one time being at a sleepover with a friend and we were playing ping pong with M&Ms. And the the game was such that if you, you know, if you missed the the, the M&M, then you had to eat it, right? So we were all eating just a ridiculous quantity of M&Ms. Well, I got very sick that night and I actually had to have my mom come and pick me up because I, I felt terrible. And so that led to another <laughs> trip to the doctors. And this was actually just after there'd also been a camping weekend where, because we were in a little tent uh, tent trailer. My mom was very much aware of how much milk was in the refrigerator. And she noticed that in the course of the day, evening, I had drunk a half a gallon of milk. Wow. That's a lot of milk. And <laughs> yeah. And so I, I owe everything to my mom. And so after those two episodes, she took me back to that same doctor and said, test her now. I'm not leaving until you do good for her. And the doctor's like, oh, sure, you're just being one of those, you know. No, I'm not. <laughs> and did the test. And lo and behold, my, you know, back then we did urine tests and they rated them on a scale of negative trace one, two, three, or four plus. And I was at a four plus. And they said, oh my gosh, she's diabetic. And <laughs> scooted me straight into the hospital where I stayed for actually a week. Wow while they got my blood sugars under control and trained me on how to give myself insulin and how to do the, the urine tests and things like that, ketoacidosis tests, wow, stuff like that. At the point that I was hospitalized, I was probably five foot two and I was 85 pounds. Wow. I was a wispy little thing. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, because I had, you know, that a classic symptom of of uncontrolled type one diabetes is you 
you you're eating all the time, but you can't take in any nutrition. Right. Wow. So that was, I was classic case. There. Yeah. Wow. And so this obviously affects your everyday life. Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. I, there was never a moment that I can really forget that I'm diabetic. Yeah. So that, can you just talk us through like, what were some of the changes that you had to make? So the biggest one obviously was I had to change what I ate. Yeah. So no more playing ping pong with M&Ms. <laughs> uh, <laughs> damn. But so back then the treatment was a, a long-term insulin uh, that you would take usually twice a day and then short-term insulins to cover meals. But the nature of the insulins were imprecise such that you couldn't really vary the time you took those insulins mm. at all. And so breakfast had to be at eight o'clock. Lunch had to be at, you know, 12 or 12 30, whatever it was. Dinner had to be between five and six. And so that was a huge change. You know, who wants to be a teenager and be on that structure of a regime? Right. But in many ways, I was very fortunate that I was 11 when I was diagnosed because I hadn't really gotten into the teenage years of I'm going to go do this wild and crazy thing and this wild and crazy thing. I was still doing the 11 year old, you know, we're going to ride our bikes all day. So in many ways, it was easier for me to adapt to that very strict meal and insulin regime. And then the other thing that I had to do was I, I really had to let all of my friends know that I'm diabetic. And that means I could have an insulin reaction if I've been exercising a lot or I haven't eaten properly. And here are the symptoms to watch out for in me. And if you see me starting to act in these ways, I need you to stop me and tell me to go get myself some sugar, or some juice. Yeah. And I know by the time I got to high school, I actually knew several kids who were diabetic and two, uh, one, they all were really rebelling against adult life, you know, and, and their parents and every form of, of, of structure in society. And so they rebelled against their diabetes. And I was extraordinarily fortunate because I had a really good doctor by that point. And she made it very clear to me. I was like, yeah, you can rebel against this if you want, but the only person you will hurt is yourself. Right. And there was the, the tendency to rebel against your parents because they were the ones constantly reminding you. But ultimately, you know, they would panic, they would be upset, they would be scared for you, but they weren't the ones who was, were going to have the, the lifelong complications if you, if you went sideways. Right, right. So what were the, the symptoms that you told your friends to look out for? So a diabetic insulin reaction is in many ways similar to being drunk. <laughs> it's often characterized by slurred speech confusion. From my perspective, I can feel my heart racing. I can feel adrenaline. I can taste adrenaline in my mouth. Wow. But if it gets bad, it's confusion. It's incoherence. It's emotional instability, just highs and lows and back and forth and, and that sort of thing. And then if you're left untreated, then you uh, can lose lose consciousness wow. and start convulsing. And that's really scary. Yeah. I think I've had convulsions only twice in my life, both times when I was quite young and, and it's, it's not, <laughs> I was oblivious, right. Cause I was unconscious, but my sister heard, uh, she slept in the next room from me and she heard my bed hitting the wall in the middle of the night Wow! and got up and saw that I was convulsing in bed so hard that I was making the bed knock against the wall. And so she ran and got mom and mom came and they started trying to pour orange juice down my throat while I was unconscious. You know, so they had me propped up and they got enough into me that I, I came to, wow. but I remember waking up from this very strange dream and finding that I was sitting up with all the lights on and I had orange juice splattered all down my shirt. 
sure. I'm like, what are you guys doing here? Wow. So it was very scary for them. Yeah, it sounds like it. Yeah. It's scary for me to think about, you know, what if my sister hadn't right. heard or had heard and thought, well, Jill's being a dork <laughs> and just left it at that. Yeah, no, lucky that she got up to check on you. <laughs> yeah. Very much so. Yeah, wow. And so did this, how did this affect like your school life? Did you have to do tests throughout the day while you were at school at all? Yeah. So I had to have insulin every time I ate. So I had to give myself shots at school. I don't recall ever having to go to the nurse's office to get my insulin though. Back then I was allowed to carry my insulin with me and give myself my shot when I needed it. Oh, wow. And I had the, all of the stuff I needed to do a urine test, a a blood sugar test. Um, I don't think, I'm trying to think, when did finger sticks for blood sugar tests come along? I want to say that was, might've been when I was college age. Um, I'm not really sure. I'm pretty, yeah, I'm pretty sure by the time I went away to college, I had finger sticks. So it must've been sometime while I was in high school, finger sticks came along. Gotcha. Did your friends ever treat you any differently? I don't know. I don't think so. The the friends that I had from younger treated me the same after, you know, they would sort of, the the, the line was just, would, would be, you know, we're going to go out for Go, go to the 7-Eleven and get candy bars. You probably don't want to get a candy bar, but you want to come and, you know, get yourself some potato chips. I mean, they were always very understanding about where my dietary restrictions were and weren't. And if we were riding bikes all over all day long, I would have a candy bar too, because I needed the sugar to give me the energy to, you know, not have an insulin reaction. Right. The thing about type one that's so infuriating is that you really need to keep in this band, right? You want your blood sugar between 80 and ideally about 140. And maintaining it in there is such a challenge because every time you eat, it goes up and every time you exercise, it goes down. So it's it, it's just tricky and takes constant monitoring. But no, all of my friends have always been really understanding, really accepting, kind of watch out for me a little bit, I think probably. That's good. But yeah. yeah, I was very fortunate in that regard. Nobody ever went, oh, look at her. She sticks herself with me. Oh, man. <laughs> yeah. In fact, what I, uh, what I do remember from friends of mine who've talked about it with me since college was they were always very impressed with how coolly I would just load up my syringe of insulin and give myself a shot in the dining hall. They're like, wow, she's so easy <laughs> with it. I'm like, well, it's because I do it five times a day. Yeah. <laughs> And you've been doing it for so long. It's just routine at a certain point. Exactly. Yeah. I mean, I remember the first time when I was in the hospital when they wanted to, me to give myself a shot, I passed out. Really? <laughs> yeah. And it actually took me about a year after I was diagnosed to be okay with giving myself a shot. For the longest time, my mom would do it. Wow. But that was not viable in the long term (laughs) yeah not as you get older and go away to college (laughs) exactly exactly so when you know and I remember I do remember one time a very good friend of mine did tease me once she said I noticed when you give yourself your shot you don't look at it I'm like well no because it's a needle going into my flesh I don't want to look at it I can feel it that's enough (laughs) like I know it's in the right spot I can feel it (laughs) I can feel it yeah Every once in a while, actually, it's funny the number of times when I give myself a shot and I don't feel it at all. Wow. So I'd be like, I think it's in. Yeah, it's in. Okay. Wow. That's impressive. Yeah. You, you get pretty good at it after, you know, 30, 40 years. <laughs> I would expect so. Yeah. <laughs> so what was it like when you went away for college then? So that was scary. So I, you know, I really had to sit my roommate down and explain to her, okay, now you're the person who's going to help me out if things go, go south. And the, the RA in our dorm knew what was going on. So they all knew to keep an eye on me. A friend of mine worked at the dining hall and she worked breakfast five days a week. And one morning I didn't show up to breakfast. And so she knew to call the RA and say, 
Jill isn't showing up for breakfast yet. I think, you know, she's diabetic. Maybe she's having a reaction. Well, what my friend didn't know is that I had spent the night at my boyfriend's <laughs> apartment on the other side of town and I'd gone to the dining hall on the other side of campus. <laughs> so, but, it, you know, but I had friends looking out yeah. for me. So it worked pretty well. In many ways, because I, I stayed in the dining hall all four years in, in no small part because it was a more regimented college experience meals were at these set times and so it was just it was a lot easier for me to to manage yeah if I'd been in an apartment and I have to worry about do I have enough money for food this week that gets a little could have been dicey (laughs) dicey yeah. yeah it has impacted my my interest in not so much my ability to but my interest in living alone I don't like living alone. That just there's too many things that could go wrong. And so I've I've made a point of having a roommate pretty much my entire life. And then I got married and I had a roommate yeah. built in. Did you ever feel that having diabetes held you back in any way? Oh yeah. All kinds of ways. Because I didn't want to take risks. I, I didn't want to put myself into a situation where I wasn't really aware of what was going on with my body. And so I didn't drink much at all during college. I think I had like half a dozen beers the whole time I was in college. There was one week where I think I, I had some, some gin and tonics when I was having a bad week, but I pretty much didn't drink alcohol as I was growing up or in college. I didn't stay up all night because I knew I needed sleep in order to stay part of that regime. Um, I didn't do drugs. I've never done recreational drugs in my life because I, I'm terrified of losing that control Mm -hmm. of my understanding of my body because that's what keeps me going. Yeah. Right. Oh, that makes sense. And especially since the, the symptoms of a low blood sugar attack are very similar to the the being drunk or being high i imagine yeah it would be hard to differentiate between the two exactly exactly yeah was it difficult being away from from your mom and and the doctors that knew that you had a condition so when i was in college i still had the same doctors okay. back. I went to college in Iowa, but I had the same doctors back in California and I would see them Christmas breaks or spring breaks or gotcha. summer breaks. So I was still under their care. I think there were a couple of times I had to go to doctors and sort of explain what was going on. But again, this really amazing doctor that I had, she's long since passed. She was in private practice up in San Francisco. Her name was Dr. Mary Olney. And she worked with diabetic kids a lot. And she told me some of the lessons she she gave me were just so invaluable. Like you will see a lot of doctors in your lifetime, but you know your body better than they do. And so you need to become your own advocate. You need to become an expert on you. And what does insulin work like in your body and what does exercise mean for your body and what do all these other factors mean for your body i had one doctor once who pointed out that there are something like 130 different factors that affect blood sugar we treat three of them right we treat insulin we treat food and we treat exercise but everything from being sick to being the weather being hot or cold, hormones if you're female, actually steroids if you're male, all of all of these other things, anxiety, they all affect your blood sugar. And so you really have to learn which ones affect you the most and what that effect is for you. And so by the time I went away to college, I was, I'd been diabetic for what, seven years by that point, I was already pretty much an expert on what was going to happen. So you were already prepared to, to handle advocating for yourself. Yeah. 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 I would not have gone to school so far away from home if I didn't feel like it, it, it felt at that point, it felt very important to me to get out and be on my own as it were still in a very protected environment, but 
but being able to do it by myself. Yeah. Knowing that you can handle it on your own. Exactly. Yeah, exactly. So how has the change in evolution of medical advancements bettered monitoring your diabetes? So monitoring, well, so in the (laughs) old days to do a urine test, first you had to empty your bladder. Then you had to wait 20 minutes. Then you had to pee into a little cup because the urine test would only tell you what had been happening in the last 20 minutes if you could guarantee that all the urine in your bladder was only 20 minutes old. Oh. So you had to void your bladder first. And then, of course, you had to drink like mad so that you had enough <laughs> that you needed to go to do again the test. The right. So that was great technology at its time. It was not great technology. <laughs> And then since then, there have been many iterations of blood glucose monitors that all are variations of you take something sharp, you stab it into your finger, you squeeze, get the blood out, stick it onto a little test strip, and it reads out the number. Much more accurate because, like I said, the the urine test would only tell you if you were negative, spilling a trace amount, or one, two, three, or four. You kind of correlate what those went to, but not always. Whereas when you get an actual blood sugar number, I now I know, okay, I'm at 160 right now, or I'm at 73. Hmm, Maybe I should have some orange juice. Then about 10, 15 years ago, I got a continuous glucose monitor, which is a little electronic device that rests on my stomach. And I use a special machine to insert a a needle into my skin and then it retracts the needle and leaves behind essentially a, a, it's not a catheter, but it's a, what's it called? It's a, it's a little plastic needle and it, it does a, it senses the glucose level of the sugar in the blood around it. And I put one of those in every 10 days (laughs) and it gives me a reading every five minutes. (laughs) Um, And so that is through my phone. I can look at my phone and see what my number is. Wow. um, Which is very nice. Still not perfect. Uh, The the first ones needed to be calibrated several times a day. So you still had to do the sticks and all of that. This one technically doesn't need calibrating, but really it does. (laughs) Um, And it... Every once in a while, it it can go just haywire for no apparent reason. Every time I put in a new sensor, I can pretty much be guaranteed that for the first 24 hours, my readings are inaccurate. Wow. And sometimes they're inaccurate by 10 or 20 points, and sometimes they're inaccurate by 100 points. Well, when it's telling you that you're at 50 and your finger stick tells you you're at 150, those are two very different Yeah, they are. (laughs) So the technology for the continuous glucose monitors is is getting better. At the same time, my dependency on them is getting more and more. I'm becoming more and more dependent on them. So six months ago, I got an insulin pump. And so now I'm like full cyborg, right? I have a, a pump that I have attached to my belt. And I have tubing that comes off of it okay. and it goes to an infusion site that is currently on my leg. And on this pump, I, it, it talks to my phone, talks to my sensor. And so it says, okay, so your blood sugar is this. So we think you need more insulin. So it gives me more insulin, which is great. It keeps me in a much narrower band without me having to work quite so hard at it. And if I have food, I tell it, hey, I'm about to have you know, 20 grams of carbohydrates, so give me X number of units of insulin accordingly. So the system is this self-contained loop of, of technology, which is great as long as it all works properly. Right. But again, when the sensor says, oh my gosh, you're at 200, and I'm actually at 
120 and my pump then says, oh, you're at 200. I'm going to start giving you insulin. I'm like, no, actually, you don't want to do that. You know, and sometimes it does it without me noticing. Oh. Uh, and so that's the biggest problem I've had with the pump is that it boluses me when I'm not expecting mm. it and when I don't need it. Like I, I started exercising and it has an exercise mode on the pump, but it doesn't cut back the insulin enough. And so then I'm low because the pump thinks I'm, you know, so it's, it's a constant, I wouldn't say it's a, a battle, but there is a, a, a certain love hate relationship with, with an insulin yeah. pump where it does a lot of really great things, but sometimes the technology isn't quite there. Yeah. Interesting. I didn't know that they had made those big steps yet. I mean, I just remember in, in elementary school and we had a kid in our class that was still doing the sticks and that's really all I knew. <laughs> Actually, one of the greatest improvements to diabetic care, I think, was when they invented insulin pens, which was instead of having a vial and a syringe and you would draw out the insulin and then give yourself a shot with the with the syringe, they now have a pen where the insulin is encased in the pen and then there's a needle at the end of the pen and you dial up the dose you need and then give yourself the shot. And you can, you're supposed to put a new needle on every time. I don't know a single diabetic who put a new needle on every time because they're expensive. Yeah, so, are. so, you know, you'd use the needle until it started to hurt because it was kind of getting old and then you'd put on a new one. But that was great because it meant I could carry my insulin around. No problem just in my purse you just have to protect it from heat and cold yeah but that gave me a degree of freedom that was remarkable the other thing was that over the years the insulins have gotten a lot better so they've gone from a long acting that lasts just eight to 12 hours now there's one that lasts 24 hours and the the short-term insulins are much more effective they start quicker they end quicker so that's also useful, very useful in, in allowing you to have better control. Do you think you prefer having the, the insulin pens? There were things about the pens I really liked, but so far I'm going to stick with my pump. I, I like it. It's, it's always going to be a trade-off. Yeah. Um, you know, I, I, I was sort of lulled into thinking when I got the pump, I could just forget about it and not have to think about being a diabetic anymore. And that's not, not the, the case. case. Yeah. It still takes monitoring quite closely. It can give me insulin every hour. So I, I kind of know what time it's likely to be giving me insulin. And so I'm checking it to see, did you give me a bolus? Was I expecting that? Did I need uh, it? Yeah. <laughs> Did I need it? Can I still go for the walk that I wanted to go on? Right. Or do I need to sugar up before I try to do anything? Right. Uh, many times I end up just turning it off when I'm exercising now because it's just, it's easier that way. So the exercise mode definitely needs to be enhanced. <laughs> yeah. And there are things about this particular pump that are really frustrating things that you can program and things that you can't program. And some of the things that you can't program are just stupid. <laughs> In my humble opinion, one of the things that is a known factor is as you, if you've been a type one diabetic and on insulin for years, as I have been, your response to insulin changes. And so an insulin that in the lab and in test subjects starts working in 15 minutes and is gone in two hours, for me, might not start working for 45 minutes and is not gone until three or four hours. Right now, I'm actually just this morning, I switched to a brand new insulin because my old insulin had gotten to the point where it was starting to work closer to two hours and lasting for five. Well, when you think that that's, yes, I'm taking a meal now, so I'm having insulin now. No, it's not going to cover that food you just ate. Right. So, and then of course, the other problem is that I give myself a bolus and then my pump says, Hey, you know, your blood sugar is getting high. Let's give you some more insulin. I'm like, no, actually I've already got the insulin on board for the food that I've eaten. It just, it hasn't worked yet. So that's one of the things I wish that the pump would let me alter, you know, program on my own is expect it to start working at our, you know, at 90 minutes and expect it to last this long. Gotcha. It doesn't do that yet. 
I'm sure it's coming. Yeah. They, they're, they're constantly coming out with, with new improved versions. So yeah, I would expect they would have something coming out soon. That would yeah help with that. Did you have any right. trouble throughout the pandemic with acquiring any supplies that you need? No. Oh, that's left. I've been, yeah, I've been doing mail order for almost all of my supplies for years and years anyway. I just became very conscious of the fact that the minute I was eligible for a refill on that prescription, I would push the button to make it happen. Okay. So I did end up stockpiling a little bit of stuff on just in case suddenly insulin wasn't available right. anymore. But that was something actually that my endocrinologist was very much aware of and, you know, and said, if you have difficulty getting supplies, let us know because we have some here in the office and we can probably give you enough to tide you through. Good. That's good. Yeah. Yeah. I, I heard that a lot of people struggled with that one. So. Yeah. It was a little scary, but it ended up not being an issue. Good. So I know it can also be passed down through familial generations. Is this something that you worried about when you were having kids? And did this affect you at all during your pregnancy? So type one diabetes is not really hereditary Mm. at all. Type two is. Gotcha. Okay. Um, Everybody thinks of them as kind of the same thing. And they're actually very, very different. The causes are different. The treatment can be similar, but type two is more with deals with insulin resistance. Your body is still making insulin, but it doesn't process it correctly. Okay. Um, and it becomes a, essentially become resistant to it. And so you have to take often a lot of insulin type one diabetics. We just, our pancreas crapped out for whatever reason. Okay. The part of it that possibly probably is hereditary is in my case, my becoming diabetic was probably an immune system disorder. I'd had, as I mentioned, a bunch of strep infections. Yeah. I'd had, I think I had strep throat three times in one year. Wow. And the thinking now is that my body responded to those infections my white blood cells went nuts. And in the process of getting rid of the strep infection, they also took out my pancreas. Mm. And so that immune system response probably is hereditary. And my brother has an immune system problem with his digestion. And so I do know that immune system problems probably do run in the family. But at the time I had my daughter, I have only one child. I knew that type one was not hereditary. So I never worried about that specifically with her. I worried about the pregnancy a great deal. When I was diagnosed, I was told, don't ever plan on having kids. If you want kids, adopt. Because pregnancy and diabetes don't mix. Wow. And so I was like, okay, I'm never having kids or maybe I'll adopt. I don't know. And then when I got married and I told my husband, we're never having kids, by the way, just so you know. And he's like, okay. Um, Then my doctor, who was a different doctor at that point said, well, you know, when you're ready to have kids, let us know because we need to make sure we've got your diabetes under really tight control. I said, I can't have kids. Oh no, the, the, the thinking around that has changed now. You can. And then suddenly it was like, oh, I can have a kid. <laughs> oh, <laughs> so the possibility. <laughs> uh, and yeah, and th- that was a very hard pregnancy. It was, it was really difficult. You know, the, all of the things that I mentioned that can affect your blood sugar, hormones. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. You're riddled with hormones. <laughs> riddled with hormones. And you've got this whole other life going on and it's messing with you. And so, yeah, so it was a problematic pregnancy, problematic delivery, but she came out. Okay. And then I'm not sure if it's related or not, but very soon after I had my daughter, my immune system flared up again. And this time it took out my thyroid. So, and it tried to take out my kidneys, but we stopped it from doing that. So I know I've got that immune system flare up response. It was one of the things that made the pandemic so particularly terrifying yeah. for me because there's the, oh, now I'm getting the word wrong. Uh, I think it's called a kytostorm. 
that the very first wave of COVID was causing. And it was basically that same immune system overwhelming. And, and in COVID's case, it would often take out the lungs or the heart. And I thought I cannot possibly get COVID because I know I have the immune system that's already predisposed to this. Right. And so I, yeah, when the, when the pandemic first hit, I locked down hard. I pretty much did not see anybody other than my husband for a year. Were you, I assume you're all vaccinated. So yes, fully vaccinated and boosted twice now. The benefits of being, being at risk and over 50. Yeah. So how, how scared were you when you got it then (laughs) recently? (laughs) When I, when I got sick and I tested positive for COVID, I was terrified. I knew that by this point it was Omicron and it wasn't nearly as bad. And I knew I was fully vaccinated. So I figured I would probably be okay, but it was still, There's still that. I was watching it very closely. And yeah. I, as soon as I tested positive, I was in contact with my doctors. Like, what do I do here? What do I do there? I got the antivirals because I am a risk. And yeah, it was my husband, (laughs) my husband pretty much did not drink a drop of alcohol for the two weeks I was sick on the understanding that he might have to drive me to the hospital at a moment. (laughs) So yeah, we were on, we were on high alert, but then it became, I mean, we have all of the equipment that you could ever possibly know. So I was taking my blood pressure. I was checking my O2 levels and my temperature and, you know, everything. But you were okay. So, but I was okay. Yeah. I did have a huge increase in my insulin dose. Not surprising. Yeah. Having any kind of infection means suddenly insulin's not working and you have to take much, much more. Right. But that was to be expected. Yeah. Wow. Do you mind telling us um, what some of the issues were during your pregnancy that you had? So, the. The classic problem is your blood sugars get too high. And then I had, in addition with that, I had a high blood pressure. And towards the end of my pregnancy, I had preeclampsia. Uh, I was on bed rest for a while because my blood pressure was getting so high, but I was able to keep it. We, we were able to keep it down to a reasonable level. And then one day I went, I was going in for monitoring just constantly. And, and one day they hooked me up to the machine and that it was oh, a month and a half before she was due to be born. And they immediately unplugged all of the stuff and said, Hey, guess what? You're going to have a baby today. I'm like, no, I'm still six weeks away. And they're like, no, you're going to have her today. Oh. <laughs> and they wheeled me over to the hospital. And, you know, I had had a high risk pregnancy the whole time. So I had had the team of doctors all sort of on standby and they wheeled me over and they said, well, well, you know, we'll try to, we'll try to let you have a natural childbirth. So they doped me up on Pitocin and that didn't work. And while we were sort of waiting for the surgeon to come to give me the spinal tap for the, for the C-section, all of a sudden this team broke into my room where I was laboring and they and I said, so what's going on? I'm like, you're going to have the baby now. And I said, no, I'm, I'm scheduled to have the spinal tap at this time. And, and they said, no, you're having it now. And we don't have time to explain to you what's going on. And that was probably one of the most terrifying moments of my life. And they wheeled me to the emergency room or the, uh, the operating room. And they had me under within five minutes. And I had the C-section and I had the baby. What I, what they hadn't been able to explain to me was that my blood pressure had spiked and that I was about to start bleeding out of all of my pores. Oh my God. That when you get preeclampsia, it's your platelets start collapsing and you just, the, 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 the the veins in your body can't contain the blood anymore. Oh my God. And so you just bleed everywhere. It's a horrible thing. Wow. So, uh, yeah, it was it was a very scary pregnancy. And and even before the actual delivery part, I mean, I had I was sick as a dog the whole time with her. Something I share with your mother, I believe. <laughs> I'm sure she could relate. I don't yeah. believe I was yeah. very kind to her when I was 
<laughs> before I was born. <laughs> Yeah. Well, my daughter was much the same way. It was, uh, or, or it was just, my body was never intended to actually reproduce. You know, that might be the other way to look at it is just, yes, I could get pregnant, but maybe I shouldn't have. So, so I have the one kid cause I'm never doing that yeah, again. Yeah. That sounds terrifying. <laughs> it was, it was very scary. And it was the sense of, I, I remember when they put the mask over my face to put me under that I might not ever wake up from this. And that was like, well, I hope somebody's going to take care of my kid. I hope she comes out. Okay. Is your husband there with you at all? He, he actually had to beg and plead with the hospital staff to come into the operating room with me. And thank God he did because while they were scurrying around doing the, the, the operation prep stuff, he just literally grabbed my face and turned it towards him and said, just look at me. Don't look at what they're doing. Cause he knew that they were putting this you know, great big needle in my arm and all of this scary stuff was going on. Mm-hmm. Um, and then they made him promise that if he passed out, they were just going to leave him on the floor and nobody was going to catch him. Wow. <laughs> because they didn't have time to deal with him. Right. They had to focus uh, on you and the baby. Exactly. And he was like, okay, I'm good with that. And they said, and actually we really want you to leave before she's fully under. And he said, okay, that'd be fine too. So he stayed until they started the anesthesia and then he skedaddled out of the room. Wow. Yeah. No. That's so and then sweet. like three minutes later, they came bursting out of the room and said, new baby coming through. And he watched this thing go by. I was like, oh, that must be my daughter. <laughs> <laughs> and she was healthy when she was born? She was not. She was what they call an infant of a diabetic mother. And because my blood sugars had been too high, you know, they've been about probably about 200 for the last month or so of my pregnancy, which is just too high. Um, And so when she was born, she was used to having extra sweet blood to nourish her. And so her pancreas was working overtime. Mm. She was having no problem. She was loving it. Well, A, she was huge. So she was uh, six weeks premature and she was eight pounds, seven pounds, 12. She was a big baby. (laughs) Um, And she was, yeah, and quite premature. But because she was infant of a diabetic mother, they had to wean her off of this incredibly sweet blood that she'd been feeding off of. Mm. And that took a week, eight days in the intensive care. Wow. Um, They had her on all manner of drips to make sure that her blood sugar didn't crash. Yeah. And were there any issues based off of just being premature? She had, she had a little bit of jaundice, but not too bad. It was, yeah. Other than that, it was mostly just her blood sugar. She had a huge bruise on her face. It was terrible because they, even though we did a C-section, right, they didn't expect her to be so large because they knew she was six weeks early. Right. So they made a relatively discreet small incision. And then they had this big honk. <laughs> so we ended up having to use forceps on her to get her oh. out. <laughs> so she came out looking like a football player with a big old bruise and black <laughs> She's born to be tough. That's all. (laughs) She is a very tough kid. Yeah. What was recovery like for you then? Was that rough too? Recovery was very tough because I had to be on a drug to combat the high blood pressure. And that drug uh, is a nasty drug. Uh, It makes you feel like you've got 102 degree fever. Oh, and so I couldn't get out of bed easily. And of course, you know, within 12 hours of the C-section, they want you to try to get up right. and start walking around. And so that was pretty brutal. The hardest part after she was born is that she was in the neonatal intensive care and I was in the mother baby unit and they were in two different buildings at this particular hospital. Oh, wow. And so yeah, it, in retrospect, not a great organizational strategy for that hospital, no. but it was a very old hospital, very good hospital, really good hospital here in Portland, but they, and they had the best uh, neonatal intensive care 
in the entire state. So it was never any question that we weren't in the right place. You just but weren't close to I had to stay. It was it was really hard because I had to stay attached to my drip system of various drugs in my room. And she had to stay in the neonatal intensive care. So I did not see her until two days after she was born. Wow, that's hard. It was really hard, especially with all of the other women on the ward. You have their... All, all their little babies and everybody's cooing over them. I'm like, well, I, I've got photographs. <laughs> here's, here's a photograph that my husband took of my baby. <laughs> but he was he was wonderful he was running back and forth between the two rooms constantly Would you- and I was pumping breast milk and sending it over to the neonatal intensive care for them to feed her oh that's good would you say yeah. that having a kid was the biggest trial that you had with your diabetes yeah yeah absolutely it's just there's so much going on yeah and you don't know what the stakes are you know, for any individual moment, any individual day, is this going to be okay for the baby or is this not? Is this going to be okay for me or is this not? You know, in retrospect, having a baby cost me my thyroid and almost cost me my kidneys. That's a little oh, oh, daunting right. for trade. But would I do it again? Yeah. Because I can't imagine life without her now, right. right? But I certainly, I knew I would never get pregnant again after having her because I, it nearly killed me. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> terrifying, um, but yeah. So, I mean, and, but I know other diabetic women who have had babies and not had those problems. So it's part of it is being diabetic. Part of it. I, I really do believe there are just some women are not meant to reproduce. My sister-in-law never had a moment of morning sickness, you know, popped out two children with relatively easy labors both times. And then other people like me and my sister just were miserable sick. And your mom, yeah, miserable sick for the entire pregnancy and had horrible deliveries. And yeah, so some people it's fine. Some people it's not. Yeah, for everyone it's different. Yeah, childbirth is not to be taken lightly. It is a big deal. Yeah. People, people can die. This isn't a political. I know. I was just thinking in my head into (laughs) having the right to choose whether or not you're pregnant. Yeah. Wow. Have there been any other big, I guess, trials that you've been through with your diabetes? So, I mean, besides like discovering it and getting pregnant, has there been any other big, big moments that you've struggled with? So the the real problem with diabetes, whether it's type one or type two, is the complications that can come along with it. And so the tighter control you're in, the, the better you can maintain your blood sugars in that 80 to 140 range, the less likely you are to have those complications. Those complications are varied. And some of them are relatively minor and some of them are quite major. And so for my entire life, I have had this weight, this Damoclean sword, right? Hanging over my head that if I'm not in good enough control, I could go blind. (laughs) Um, Diabetic retinopathy is a very real thing where you're the, 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 veins in your, in your eyes get damaged by extra blood in your sugar, uh, extra sugar in your blood, excuse me. And, and you go blind. There's the very real threat of kidney disease, losing your kidneys. There's a very real threat of diabetic neuropathy, which is damage to your nerves in your feet. Your feet can go numb or it can be just unbelievably painful. I, I know people who have neuropathy in their feet and it feels like little red ants are biting their Ugh. feet. And it's this burning, nasty stuff, right? One of the ones that I never knew about that I now suffer from is gastroparesis, which is nerve damage of the nerves around the stomach. And so my stomach doesn't work quite properly Mm. anymore. I don't digest food as well as I used to. So it's slower. Certain foods set me off. So fried foods is now right out of my diet because they just make me sick as a dog because my body, my, my stomach just can't handle 
those sorts of foods, very high fiber foods, unfortunately. Wow. So diet has become a major challenge as I've gotten older. All of the things that are good for me to eat as a diabetic, high fiber, (laughs) no processed white flour, multigrains all the way versus gastroparesis, only processed flours, no fiber. Right. Exact opposites. (laughs) Right. Direct opposites. So where's that? that happy medium where I can still eat something and enjoy life and not make myself sick from one side or the other. Right. And it's, it's a challenge. Yeah. That doesn't sound like an easy balancing act at all. It's (laughs) it's a tricky one. Yeah. So, and with every decade or so of being diabetic, there's a new thing that comes along, right? There's, I started to notice this symptom. I started to notice this symptom and you just your body becomes, and it gets, it's, it gets worn down. Yeah. That means wears down your body. So it's a matter of keeping that wear and tear to a minimum. Yeah. While still living a life that is, you know, worth living. Obviously right. you could, you could sit and be completely compulsive about insulin and food and, you know, but there comes a point where you have to actually live your life and go for a hike and run the risk of going low. Right. Right. Wow. That's a lot. A lot to keep track of. <laughs> it's a lot to keep track of. The good thing is you don't have to do it all at once, right? You, you, you build up to it. Yeah. And you get to know your body really well. Yeah. Yeah. You'll always know when something's not quite right. Yeah. Yeah. In fact, I knew when I did come down with COVID, I knew I had it before I ever tested positive for it. Because I was like, no, this isn't feeling right. And I tested and it was negative. And I thought, well, maybe it's just the flu, but mm, I don't think so. And then the next day or two days later, I tested positive. I'm like, yeah, I kind of knew it. And you were right. Yeah, I was right. (laughs) Wow. Well, thank you for being willing to come on and share your experience. Oh, my pleasure. Yeah, this was, I thought this was just so interesting because, I mean, like I said at the beginning, you know, you were diagnosed back when it wasn't that common. And so even though diabetes is more common now, you know, it, again, your doctor's pushback of like, oh, that can't possibly be what's wrong versus now it's like, oh yeah, we'll test for that. (laughs) Yeah. 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 I I do think that the, the fact that it's more common now that type one is more common now is an indication that it is an immune system disorder, yeah. that it's frequently caused by an immune system kerfluffle <laughs> because those are more common now. Yeah, they are. We are seeing more and more kids with different kinds of immune systems, whether it's, you know, an asthma response or, or whatever. Yeah. I've seen a lot more arthritis. I've seen more and more kids with arthritis at a very young age, Yeah, which is again, you know, for RA, it's an immune system, I believe. Yeah. So yeah, I got arthritis when I was 18. Yeah. See, that's too young. Yeah. I agree. (laughs) (laughs) Well, we'll do something about that. Yeah. Well, thank you for coming on. It was really nice talking to you and, and hearing about all these things, no matter how scary some of them were. (laughs) I'm still here. I live. Exactly. You're still here all loving good. life and you've got a beautiful baby girl and my my baby girl is 28. She's still your baby girl. I'm still my mom's baby girl. My- so Yeah. That's true. That's true. Yeah. All right. Well, thank you for having me. Yeah, it was my pleasure. Thanks for listening to this week's episode of Body Talk with Bex. I hope you enjoyed this interview with Jill about finding out she has type 1 diabetes and lots of her trials that she's had throughout her life with dealing with it and being able to grow with the technology that has come out around it. And if you enjoyed this episode, please leave me a review on Apple Podcasts or wherever it is that you're listening to podcasts at. Also consider becoming a patron on patreon.com. 
And if you would like to share your story or know somebody who would like to, I can be contacted through my website, www.bodytalkwithbex.com or on social media. Thanks for listening.